Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor uh, to acknowledge uh, David Sudlack as the uh, recipient of this year's uh, 2014 Clark Prize. Uh, David is a professor, uh, chaired professor at University of California, Berkeley. He's also co-director of the Berkeley Water Center, and he's deputy director of our NSF Engineering Research Center on reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. David was raised on um, Oyster Bay in uh, New York on Long Island, and he told me that growing up in a town like Oyster Bay, it was hard not to be attracted to water, uh, but it was also hard not to be concerned about the pollution of water. And like many of us, perhaps, uh, we had someone in our uh, high school that influenced us in our career choices, and David had a chemistry teacher, and she suggested to David that he might want to go on to and study chemistry in college, and he did. David went to Cornell. He studied uh, environmental science, and afterward he worked as a, uh, as a uh, consulting engineer for a couple of years before uh, going back to school for a, a, a PhD. Um, for his PhD, he chose to go to the University of Wisconsin. Now at that time, the University of Wisconsin uh, had among the leading program in the US on uh, water chemistry and produced some of the best scientists that were studying the behavior of persistent contaminants like PCBs and DDT. David's PhD thesis was titled Abiotic Oxidation of Polychlorinated Biphenyls. Uh, this is a paper from uh, uh, one of several that came from his thesis, and I've underlined a few things here. I won't read them to you, but I think this is um, these um, lines in this early paper um, remained a cornerstone in uh, David's work for the future. And what would be these cornerstones? One is uh, redox reactions. David's worked a lot on iron and manganese. Uh, photochemical processes and uh, free radical chemistry in aquatic systems. Now after he uh, uh, finished his PhD, he and Meg went to um, Switzerland uh, to do a post, David did a postdoc at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology. And he worked with uh, here, Jörg Hornet, uh, also, whoops, well, I skipped, I went too far, so there we are, with Jörg, and then also at the time met uh, Urs von Gupten as well. Uh, so um, Jörg was a tremendous influence on David. He taught him how to think like a scientist. He also showed him that uh, one could balance the desire to make a difference in the world with the need to do cutting edge science. Now Jörg has been a big influence in the life of many others, who's but he's a person who's probably not well known to many of us in the audience here, um, yet he contributed so much to our understanding of, uh, of ozone, photochemistry, and advanced oxidation processes. And with that uh, experience in the postdoc, uh, David and Meg moved to Berkeley, and uh, David took up residence here in the Circle Building, that's uh, Davis Hall. I can say as an aside, there are not many pictures of the UC campus that actually show Davis. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not that attractive a building, but there it is. Uh, uh, so, what, uh, so David began studying trace organic chemicals in water and looking into the fate of wastewater-derived contaminants. And that's become such an important theme in his work and also in California as we look to um, implementation of water reuse systems. So this is a early uh, paper from David, uh, dated 2000. And uh, this was one of a landmark of, uh, of some papers to come from David. But I look at this one 
and think of it as the first one that was published in the U.S. to draw attention uh, to the detection, treatment, and removal of uh, uh, problematic um, effluent-derived contaminants. Today, we might refer to those as contaminants of emerging concern or uh, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. This problem had been identified in uh, Europe just a few years ago, and uh, uh, David uh, drew attention to that. Um, David has since studied pharmaceuticals and personal care products, including estrogenic chemicals, and those, as you know, have received uh, so much attention in the popular press. Now, David and his students have studied um, the fate of these kinds of chemicals in natural systems, and I wanted to show one example of this, uh, looking at the fate of chemicals in, uh, in this case, in the uh, Trinity River. Now, the Trinity River, for much of its uh, uh, time during the year, is basically wastewater from uh, Fort Worth and Dallas. It's what we call an effluent-dominated river, and that uh, David, with his students, could study uh, the natural processes that would result it possibly in the transformation of some of these um, personal care products and uh, uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, this points to, uh, to the example here of what's so common in the United States of um, de facto water reuse, and uh, meaning that this water in the Trinity River flows into Lake Livingston, and Lake Livingston then becomes the water supply for the city of Houston. So David was a member of the NRC study that Rhodes Trussell chaired uh, that uh, looked at water reuse, and um, this became one of the case studies in, in uh, uh, that work. Um, David's continued to study the role of uh, trace chemicals in uh, water reuse systems, uh, looking at chemicals that might be formed by the treatment processes themselves or that might actually sort of escape through the treatment processes that we would use in uh, uh, potable reuse systems. Uh, Bill Mitch, that's in the top photo here, now a professor at Stanford, uh, with David studied um, the formation of uh, NDMA, a troublesome disinfectant uh, byproduct, small polar molecule that can make its way through RO systems. And uh, they studied not only its formation, but how to uh, uh, do the correct chemical addition to minimize the, the formation of that compound. Um, recently, too, he's uh, undertaken a study of the types of chemicals that are uh, small, again, polar compounds that may account for um, odors in uh, highly treated wastewater. And this was a study that was started with, in, uh, uh, with support from uh, the Public Utility Board in uh, Singapore, and now it continues uh, with uh, uh, postdoc uh, Flo Boven at uh, UC Berkeley. David's had a long interest in looking at uh, natural systems as part of our urban water infrastructure. Um, he and Justin Jasper had done studies at an, uh, a certain type of a wetland, one that uh, you call like an open water cell, here to look at the role of photolysis to um, degrade compounds and also the role of the uh, biomat that will form in a shallow pond that would comprise uh, diatom and uh, bacteria. And here, this illustrates uh, photolysis of a beta blocker for pinolol in this case. Um, David, in his talk, will discuss about innovation in our industry and about the importance of scale up. And with support from Orange County, we've been able, through our center and with David and his students and others, to try out this idea of this um, open water uh, wetland at very large scale, of effectively a full scale system. Um, and the idea here is to evaluate the performance of this type of a wetland 
that would use the photolysis and the, and the biomat to control both uh, troublesome organic compounds and also help with some nutrient removal. Now in this particular system, the water that's being uh, treated here is diverted water from the Santa Ana River, which also at this time of year is an effluent dominated river. Um, so I wanted to show this, these pictures here of, um, of David and uh, of field work. Um, another event that occurred this year is notable in David's life is the publish, uh, publishing of this book, Water 4.0, on the um, past, present, and future of urban water. And he desired that uh, this uh, book would tell the story or convey to non-experts on how to make informed decisions about the future of, of about the future of our water. Um, after publishing this work, David has become a sort of a minor celebrity in our field, at least as much as a celebrity as you can be, I guess. Uh, being interviewed on NPR uh, three times that I'm aware of, Marketplace, Living on Earth, and All Things Considered. I, I guess, David, all we need now is Terry Gross to call, and then, <laughs> then you have it. They keep the fingers crossed. Um, I wanted to mention uh, uh, David's family here, too. Meg, uh, Jane, and Adam are sitting here at the table, and um, I know that they had a role in accommodating the long hours and strange vacation places that you went <laughs> while David was writing this book. So you, you played a role in that as well. For the past um, uh, four to five years, uh, David and I have been working together on uh, the, the startup and then launch and uh, successful implementation of an engineering research center for reinventing the nation's urban water infrastructure. Um, some of you in the audience might be surprised that this really did join forces between Cal and Stanford. Uh, we also... <laughs> We also have uh, uh, partners. <laughs> All right, I teach at Stanford, but as many of you know, I have three degrees from Berkeley, so there we go. I'm a hybrid. I, I, Jerry Schnorr would call me purple, I think. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, the, the goal here is to um, um, look at how we can reinvent our urban water systems uh, towards a future that embraces more sustainable and reliable practices than what we've used in the past. An important goal of Renewit is to work with industrial partners, some of whom are in this room tonight, um, and with the industrial partners, help us in the translation of developments from the laboratory to the test bed to actual implementation. And that's the goal of our, of our center. And then uh, lastly, on a uh, personal note, <laughs> yeah, one joke picture here. Uh, I was the um, uh, official nominator for David, and I wrote a, a congratulatory letter that's now framed and was in the hallway there. But I, I wanted just to read um, uh, a note, a couple sentences from the end of my letter. And it goes, David, I admire your ability to help catalyze change in urban water systems from both institutional and technical perspectives. You are a thoughtful sp spokesperson for our profession on water technology and policy, and you are on a wonderful path for future leadership on innovative solutions. It has been delightful to work with you and learn from you these past years. And now, please join me in welcoming David Sedlak, this year's recipient of the 2014 Clark Prize. So uh, I'd like to have Morton Irvine Smith come up, and we're going to present David with the medal and his prize. Mort's going to say something.
before we get to the fun tonight, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Morton Irvine Smith. I am the youngest of three brothers. Uh, some of you uh, have met uh, in past uh, awards. Uh, my brother Jim Swindon, and I have another brother, um, Rear Admiral Russell Penniman, uh, who's not often here, but uh, he always wishes he was. And of course, my mother is Joan Irvine, uh, who co-founded this award with her mother, Athley Clark, uh, many years ago, uh, 21 to be exact. Uh, pretty easy to figure that one out. And I thought, being that um, I was asked to speak tonight um, on behalf of the family, and I know that the normal protocol is to give a, a stoic dialogue on, on Athley and, and uh, the creation of the Institute and um, things that you heard 20 times before. I thought that it would be appropriate uh, tonight um, t for those of you who never knew my grandmother or uh, uh, maybe met her in passing uh, when you were young, uh, younger, um, I thought I would share some of the memories that I had so that you got to know the face behind the smile on the medal. And uh, because I assure you it was genuine and um, I thought maybe the way to get through this would be to chronologically go through how I got to know her and, um, and the messages that came to me uh, in regards to how it applies to why you're all here in the room. Uh, but my grandmother uh, was, a, was a giant uh, amongst people. And um, I was speaking with one of the guests earlier tonight about how how nice it is to um, be remembered in the way that she's being remembered tonight uh, with all of the great minds in this room and uh, in a true valuable human commodity which is stewardship and uh, all of you are stewards uh, and I, I think it's kind of hard to, to always acknowledge that that um, without your stewardship uh, we this planet would be worse off the human condition would be worse off and um, uh, I think that it needs to be recognized just by every person that you touch with your science uh, that that's the value. Um, I, I remember my grandmother, um, I grew up, just to give you a little background on myself and what water meant to me, uh, and I grew up in Virginia in a town of 500 people and we had three wells on our property and it was the best damn water you ever tasted. And um, they weren't far from the house, and I lived in Bull Run Mountains, and I had a distinct memory now at 49 years old of how good that water was and what clean water really meant. Uh, we were a working farm, 200 horses. Uh, we grew alfalfa and uh, uh, all kinds of other things to, that were sustained by the farm itself. Uh, and I met my grandmother there. She had a farm as well, which is now owned by Bobby Duvall, much sexier, but he's not quite the farmer she was. And um, it was actually uh, owned, uh, uh, George Washington had learned to survey there. And it was an old house that didn't used to have indoor plumbing, of which was converted. And I remember seeing the grace of this woman in this colonial. And uh, she was not, she, she was large in stature. My grandmother stood about uh, five foot 11. And she would have grand parties uh, at this house that uh, often included the president. Uh, at the time, President Nixon, who she was uh, very close with. And uh, um, Ronald Reagan did not attend uh, any parties there, although she was close with him. But um, uh, I realized that there was something, this woman, uh, having grown up in a town of 500 people, and I had this grandmother that, that affiliated with these people I saw in the news a lot. Not always good for President Nixon, but saw him there quite a bit regardless. And um, I realized that she, the way she carried herself was something special and that uh, I had no idea what an ally she would be as a person growing up. Um, I'm going to jump ahead forward to just kind of, again, I want to get back to this point of stewardship and what you each really mean. And that's just not inclusive of the laureates, but those individuals in this room that thought enough to be here tonight to follow or to learn something or to just admire the laureates in the room and possibly with a little stroke of luck, maybe be a laureate uh, in, this, in this room for this medal. Um, my, my grandmother, when I started coming to California on a regular basis when I was in college, I had the opportunity of meeting uh, somebody in this room 
who has impacted my life in, in a very positive way, uh, only in a positive way. And I've known him for 30 years at 49 years old. And his name is Pierre Swan. And um, Pierre has been instrumental in this county's water business uh, since then. And again, how would a 19-year-old kid uh, who attends the University of Rhode Island meet one of the water, uh, um, uh, one of the one of the giants in Orange County water preservation at 19? And I can call him a, a very close friend. Of, I mean, I'd be better. It sounds sexier if it was Walt Disney, but it's not. It's Pierre Small. And. Um, so again, water hits my world. I'm only here for weeks at a time. I go back, I study in college. I come back to make my first, uh, as a bachelor, I come back to California uh, permanently in the, uh, after I graduated. And I had the privilege of living with my grandmother, which I'm sure she would not say was such a privilege. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, uh, we saw each other at breakfast and sometimes at dinner and sometimes at 3 in the morning. Um, but when you live with, when you, it was an interesting combination because she was, I was the youngest and the last of her grandchildren, and she was in her um, stately years, I guess I could say, not in any way old, but uh, at the peak of her knowledge as an individual and the peak of her impact as a person. And um, I remember going to a club for dinner uh, here in Orange County by the name of the Pacific Club. And there was a, a, very, a very nice maitre d' that always gave my grandmother ultimate attention. And his name was Tony. And um, Tony was, she was always conversational with everybody around her. For those of you who don't know, this is, I think, part of the greatness of this woman, was she admired anybody that had anything to admire. And um, I also wanted to add, for each of the laureates, um, for those of you who never knew her, and, and many of you did cross her path, but she would be so interested in each and every one of your special specialties in your own special science. She would sit you by her side. She would ask that you come sit just individually, forget the party around you, and please tell her about the important work that you're doing. And she would never take her eyes off you until she got the whole story and she would finish with, I think what you're doing is fantastic. And I promise you, she would have done that with every one of you. And that's how much she cared about what you do, regardless of its diversity or whether she had a favorite that was, you know, that to, more to her liking in the science, she would have not have any favorites. If it was special in, in any regard, she got it. And you'd know it from her. So by the fact when you have that medal on your chest, and I see them, and every year I come back and I see one more than the year before, and uh, my grandmother's been gone almost uh, 20 years. And for someone that it, uh, in, it her impact was, uh, uh, it, it, it charged me with the responsibility of being involved, to being up here on this podium, to um, instilling my, um, um, compassion for her legacy onto my kids. I mean, this doesn't work for our family if my kids don't get the same inspiration that I get when I get to stand in a room with folks like yourself. And uh, it has to be generational. And I can say that from my standpoint, it is so far. I can assure you I will do what I can to inspire my kids to do the same. And um, I, I hope that I gave you a little insight from coming up one year away from a middle-aged guy's opinion of the woman whose name is on that medal and what it would have meant to each of you and to know that each of you would have been, uh, in her eye, the very best in the world, and, uh, which you are. And I think there's some people in the back of the room that are probably aspiring to be the same. So on that note, I just I, I thank you for listening to me, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I would love to meet everybody. If I didn't get a chance, please come up and say hello. And uh, I look forward to seeing the 21st uh, medal on this gentleman's shoulders. Now, for those of you who don't know, there is $50,000 in this envelope. Thank <laughs> you.